I'm Neil Troutman, and in this segment we're going to talk about why ethics and integrity is law enforcement's greatest training need. The reason for this isn't complicated. It's because nothing else devastates us as much. If you could line up all the 800-something thousand officers full-time in law enforcement and, 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 and survey them about what's the greatest leadership need, what's the greatest training need, few would say it's going to be ethics. But I'm here to tell you the reason why that's not true. Ethics and integrity is, is law enforcement's greatest training and leadership need because nothing else devastates us as much. Beginning in the academy, if you can think back to the group of 30 or 40 people that you went to the academy with, you probably have heard about some people that have gotten in trouble, lost their jobs, been terminated, fired, so forth and so on. Maybe even some that have gone to prison. In, a, in addition to the fact that, that nothing destroys individuals more than an act of, of corruption, Nothing destroys the entire organization as much as an act of, of, of corruption. From many perspectives, from the political perspective, politicians run from, from an organization that is in the midst of a scandal. They don't want to be associated with it. They, they don't want to be viewed as, as supporting it with resources. So, so, but, so budgets tend to, to dry up. Media attacks, shame, disgrace, how you feel about wearing your uniform, and, and, and you know how reporters and newspaper uh, newspaper accounts and, and television segments over and over and over, sometimes twisting and distorting what the facts are and what, what the truth is, bringing shame on the organization. That then results in people picking sides after a scandal hits so that, that the organization becomes divided. And talking about people, line supervisors, mid-level management, administrators, the reality once again is what holds the greatest potential for destroying your career goals, your career dreams, is scandal, is corruption, is misconduct. And you don't have to have any knowledge that it was occurring. You don't have to have been there at all. You, you, it doesn't, it's not like you had to have anything to do with it. But let it be your shift, your squad, your unit, your division, and see what happens to your career. And the reason for that is because you will always have this cloud. You, there will always be people who will suspect and wonder if you knew, if you covered it up to some extent if you had any knowledge whatsoever, regardless of what you say, and you'll pay a price for that for your entire career because when it comes time for promotions or transfers that you, that you want, the people making those decisions, it's simply safer for them not to go there, to pick somebody else who hasn't been tainted, who doesn't have this cloud over them because, because their careers can be on the line for who they pick for promotions. It's simply safer not to go to you. And then the last, the last reason is the most devastating, the most disheartening of all. The last reason is this. Every study I've ever read has shown that at least twice as many people in law enforcement commit suicide than die in the line of duty. And let, let me touch on that, that phrase, die in the line of duty. That, that isn't what many people think. It's not the number of personnel that's gonna be murdered this year in law enforcement. It's two statistics combined that defines that phrase, die in the line of duty. In addition to murders, it's also those that will die by accident. A couple of times in the last decade, there have been more accident deaths than those felonious assaults and, and, and murders. Every study, to the best of my knowledge, that's ever been done has shown that at a minimum, twice as many of us commit suicide than die in the line of duty. Some of them will result because they've committed misconduct. They've been found out and their life is turned upside down, regardless of how they were able to rationalize it, regardless of the financial need that, that may have drove them to, to the act. Picture, wherever you work, being a sworn personnel, and you now know that the administration internal affairs is on to you, and you know they know everything, and you know what's coming. Not only are you going to lose your job, you're going to lose your career, but it's worse than that. You're going to hurt those that love you the most in life, your immediate family. In some cases, the person walks out of their building and reporters have already heard about it and they're camped out in, in, the, in the parking lot and the film crew's going and the photographers are, are, are taking snapshots and there's, there's reporters trying to get quotes from you. And you finally get to your car and you realize, where are you gonna go? You know, you, you shut the door, you even locked, locked the, the, the door, you've turned on the engine, where are you gonna go, home? to face your family, to tell your, your spouse what you've been doing and trying to rationalize and, and, and somehow convince him or her that it was okay, you've lost everything, that you're not gonna have a paycheck, you're not gonna have health insurance for your kids. And speaking of your kids, 
try to imagine finding the words to tell your kids what you've done, what the hero to them has done, to prepare them for the television segments, the news accounts, and perhaps worse, what they're going to have to endure when they go to school. You know how brutal kids can be to other kids. I can't comprehend what that must be like. But in the end, there's some good news, and it's relatively recent. Thanks to the International Association of Chiefs of Police in the mid-1990s, mid 1996 to be exact, they established the first ethics training committee in American Law Enforcement Nas National Committee. And it, was, it met with great success, and it's been uh, implemented as, as a standard committee. Now it's called the Police Ethics and Image Committee. And, and they were the first ones to do national research. Every member of ICP got a confidential survey about what they're doing and so forth. But as, after, after ICP did that, federal funding came down from Washington and, and dozens and dozens and dozens of, 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 of million and multi-million dollar grants have now run their course in, in, a, in, a, in a, a, a tidal wave of, of, of facts and knowledge has, has been born in the last decade. The challenge now isn't what it was a decade ago. It wasn't to do research to find facts about it. We, we've done that. Thousands of scandals have been dissected and analyzed from that bore all the knowledge that we need. The challenge now is to get the knowledge to the people who need it, people who, who are at risk. The, great, the, the, the reality is that of those, of those 800,000 and so law enforcement officers in America, the training to prepare them for the toughest decisions they will ever make, the toughest decisions, ask yourself this, what have been, what's been the toughest decisions you've ever faced in your, in your life? Because what I'm saying they've been have been ethical dilemmas. Think of the toughest moments you've ever had in your life. And you tell me it isn't true that the toughest moments, almost without exception, have not been ethical dilemmas of some type. Compare that fact to the fact that most law enforcement agencies have, have out, out of the academy and service-wise, internal training, have not even done one hour of internal training to prepare, the, to prepare all the officers in America for their career's toughest moments. You know, where have we been? Yet another reason why it's the greatest leadership and training need in America. And in the end, it's good news, because in the end, we have all the knowledge we need. Now all we need to do is prepare people to face those toughest moments, to conduct the training. And some organizations, administrators, are fully supportive of this and are behind it, resources are poured into it. And other ones, and other organizations, they, they need a, a change agent. They need somebody to get behind this and, and, and push for internal training that's going to prepare people for their career's toughest moments. If you work in one of those, one of those organizations, perhaps it could be you.
I'm Neil Troutman. In this segment, we're going to talk about what's referred to as the corruption continuum. Thankfully, after more than a decade of study, after thousands of scandals have been analyzed and dissected, we understand how corruption begins and the phases it goes through as the organization becomes more and more dysfunctional. So let's begin with the first phase. The first phase is indifference. Indifference to the areas of leadership and management where the indifference will serve as a cause, as, as, as a core foundation for dysfunction to begin. And they're dependent upon whether or not you want to combine some titles or, or, or separate them. The first area is recruitment. Recruitment is usually not a high priority in many law enforcement agencies, and some, sometimes in, in federal agencies, a different entity actually does, does the recruitment process. In others, it's a high priority, but the fact remains that you can't have an exceptional organization if you can't get good people to apply. If you've got good, good solid people that have solid character and high integrity, then many other problems, such as just discipline, accountability, role modeling, are never going to be a problem because they're never going to be an issue because of the character of those that, re, that, were, recru that were, were, were recruited. The second area is hiring. Regardless of the assortment, the number of hiring steps that an organization has by far, the best predictor of future behavior always has been and always will be background investigations. In federal law enforcement agencies, they, many times there are people who separate from the organization that handles the background investigation. It's got to be thorough. If someone were to say to me, if you could only set one goal for the organization, what goal is going to have the best return for the resources spent in terms of integrity and maintaining a culture that promotes honesty and dignity and integrity, I would always say, a solid, high-quality, thorough background investigation because it's always going to be the best predictor of future behavior. Next of these 12 areas, role modeling. In some law enforcement agencies, they're referred to as field training officers, F FTOs. There are different titles for the same thing. But the fact remains, peer pressure doesn't go away because you're 24 or 34 as opposed to 4 or 5 on the schoolyard as a child. Peer pressure is always going to be the greatest way to alter behavior. And people are, ne are never more susceptible to peer pressure when they're, when they're brand new inside of an organization. And the reality is that law enforcement is clannish. So that people who enter the law enforcement force, their first supervisor in many organizations is, is that field training officer. They're like robots, the field training officers. And, and new officers, new personnel clone the behavior, the actions, the attitude. If in fact you have some field training officers that are disgruntled and cynical and bitter, even if, you, even if your hiring process has done a good job, your recruitment process was right on target, those, those first role models can counteract all the, good, all the good work that's been done. And by the time the person's done cycling through several field training officers, now you have a cynic who's still a new employee. It's incredibly powerful. Then also, Political interference. Political interference in law enforcement has several different shapes. Historically, the most devastating to law enforcement has been political interference with hiring. The fact remains that anything that causes the hiring standards for an organization to be lowered, and political interference is one of them, nothing can alter that. Nothing can counteract that. If, you, if you've lowered your hiring standards and you hire people that should never be given a badge or a uniform anywhere in America, this is going to be misconduct. And no discipline, no role modeling, no, no leadership. Nothing's going to change the character of a person after they're an adult and they're wearing their uniform. If the person's a, a thief or a, a bully or abusive in some way, the norm is they will lie low, figure out how to manipulate the system, how to, how to con people, how to get away with what their character drives them to do, and then they continue to do it. The other, another type of political interference is interference, that, that, uh, interference about transfers and promotions. In other words, the most, the most capable, the most qualified, the person who should be selected to be promoted isn't because of political inter interference. Another form of political interference is, is discipline. Interf politi political inter inter interference with the accountability of those, whether it's progressive discipline or some other form of discipline, that because of politics, a person isn't disciplined like they should, doesn't receive discipline at all in, in some cases. Then the last type of political interference is interference where the political body budget time providing resources to the organization doesn't provide sufficient resources or the budget is, is, is simply cut in other words and the organization can't do its job that it's mandated to do. 
as a result of that, units are cut, personnel sliced, response time is just slower than it, than it used to be, and, and of course politically, fingers be pointed from politicians to the law enforcement or organization when the, when the headlines finally develop or the misconduct happens as a result of rationalizing the, 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 the lack of compensation and so forth and people steal. Now that was political interference. The, the next type of, 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 of indifference that, that, that can happen is anger, sometimes referred to as, as, as bad morale. Try to find a law enforcement organization that does not have a morale problem. Virtually everybody does. But then try to find a law enforcement organization that has, that's actually taken some substantial steps, st st standardized process, even to find the need of their bad morale. The misconduct happens in two big ways. One is unexpected acts of anger, lust, greed, and peer pressure. But then in a bigger way, the, gr the greatest number of those who commit misconduct commit misconduct out of their own anger and their frustration. They become bitter and, and cynical. They've, they've literally become blinded by, by their anger and their cynicism. Then they can rationalize the misconduct. So if we are indifferent to why people are angry and frustrated, then we don't, find, we, don't, we don't find the cause of that and we can't correct it. So this indifference is just gnawing away at trying to maintain integrity. Another, another item that we can be indifferent to is the code of silence. The only way that a law enforcement organization cannot have the code of silence, if it's a very tiny law enforcement organization and everybody hates each other, and the reason for that is the, the phrase, the code of silence, is simply a phrase that we put on the phenomenon of emotional bonding. It is a natural phenomenon for people to, to build bonds of loyalty to, towards each other. It's, it's directly connected with peer pressure. The, the importance of the code of silence is this. Systemic corruption, systemic, a fancy word that simply means it's, it's, it's so systemic that it's become part of the culture. There's never been a documented case where loyalty to honor and integrity has culture-wide become more prominent than loyalty to another person. Virtually all corruption is exposed not from within, but from other sources or, or someone being, being ar arrested. If we can figure out how to counteract the code of silence so that loyalty to honor and integrity really is the highest priority over everything else, then when someone's beginning misconduct, cancer begins with, with one or two people and, and, and it, acts, I mean, it acts like a cancer misconduct does and, 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 and it spreads and it grows in both the numbers of those involved and, and in its severity. If, 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 if there wasn't for the code of silence and people, people and employees in an organization, their highest priority was truly honor and integrity, then either formally or informally, they would attack the person who's beginning the misconduct. So it can't spread, so it can't become systemic. But because of the code of silence, the tendency to look the other way, or in some cases actually lie to internal affairs or in, or in, a, in an official report to help cover up the misconduct, the, the, the misconduct that acts like a cancer continues to spread and overwhelm people. And many times when it breaks, people who were un, uninvolved at all in the actual incident lose their job and career because they didn't report it, they falsified a record. So understanding the code of silence and doing something ab about it is, is crucial. Another one of these areas of, of leadership and management that we're indifferent to that, that destroys us is promotions and, and transfers. There's been research on morale, bad morale in law enforcement now. The number one source, according to the research, and it was a, a large scale research, the number one source via confidential surveys listed by employees in law enforcement across the nation, the number one source of their anger and frustration, bad morale in other words, was the reality or perception of favoritism. Favoritism in terms of promotions and, and, and transfers. The worst that we can do in, in terms of promoting misconduct is to ignore the obvious. If we, if we ignore the fact that the perception is that favoritism runs promotions and transfers, then the anger and the frustration, the bitterness, the rationalization can grow. So the best that we can do is to, is to acknowledge that this is a possibility, that the, the, the perception is that promotions and transfers are unfair, and address it. Do a needs assessment about it. Act, act, ask for a, a committee to investigate uh, whether or not uh, promotions and transfers are, in fact, 
uh, following standardized policies and, and, re and regulations. Next, internal training. All areas of potential indifference. Internal training, I'm talking about training about ethics and integrity related. I, I like to refer to it as career survival training where, where the, the internal training, every moment of it, is about getting everybody there to the retirement, getting everybody there to, 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 a, second, to, a, to a second career. There are many types of different, of different training areas related to, to integrity and, and, and misconduct. All of them, all of them, I think, should focus on getting everybody to the career, thus the name career survival. The, the second phase, the first, the first phase in, in this con corruption continuum is indifference to the areas of leadership and management that, that matter, that have direct connections to integrity. The second phase is ignoring obvious ethical problems. The reality is, if we're indifference to all these different areas, there's going to be obvious ethical problems. If, if, if background investigations are a low priority and, and field training officers are, are disgruntled and, 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 and bitter and there's, there's favoritism in, in promotions and people are promoted that shouldn't be, there are going to be obvious ethical problems. There's no way that, that, that there's not going to be. The worst thing that can happen once again is ignoring the obvious ethical problems. This is the second phase. In order for the continuum to begin, the sequence has to begin with the first phase go on to the second phase. If the second phase, ignoring obvious ethical problems, continues, both the first and second phase will, will, will carry on, but now you have a third phase. In the third phase, hypocrisy and fear are the adjectives that best define the third phase. Hypocrisy. I'm, a, I'm an employee in an organization that's had this phase for several years and has had this phase for several years. Those are still there, but I'm an employee, and, and let's let's take this uh, this brief case study. I'm a, I'm um, I'm somewhere that an administrator is giving a, a presentation, and it's and it's going well, and there's polite applause, and, and heads are nodding in approval, and so forth. And I'm I'm not disgruntled. Let's say I'm a, I'm a tenure tenure agent, and I'm standing in the back in the in the back of the room, and I'm upset. You know why I'm upset? It's not because the presentation, there's any problem with it. I'm upset because the presentation's going so well and I know the truth, the, thus the hypocrisy of it all. The truth, the, the, we have glaring problems. We're hiring people that we shouldn't be hired if, if you're an organization down in this third phase. We have, we have leadership that, that, that leads by, sh by fear, that, that ridicules and demeans, humiliates people on an everyday basis. Favoritism runs the department, at least that's the, that's the perception. And none of those things are being addressed. Yet out to the citizens and other officials and other government entities, everything looks fine and, and the years just keep rolling by and it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm upset because I still care. And the fear part of this, of this level, you, when you go into an organization and you're, you're doing a needs assessment, you can, you can literally put in which of these faces the organization is. And one of the variables in this third phase is fear. And you find this because people have written memorandums saying that we need to address uh, field training officers who are, who are bitter, hateful cynics and how they're, how they're turning new employees into and, and also being hateful where they actually think that the leadership is, is, is their adversary when they get done with the, when they get with them with the program. Hypocrisy and fear, it's insidious and it just continues to grow and grow and grow. And then in the final phase, it's the phase that most organizations never reach. In other words, graphically, this represents, uh, this represents a lot of different organizations. Then fewer reach the second phase, even fewer reach the third phase. In the fourth phase, just a small percentage. Th these are the organizations that get the consent decrees that, 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 are, that are literally systemically corrupt, and they usually stay in that, in that fourth phase year after year after year. The two, the two terms that best fit this, this final fourth phase are hopelessness, Hopelessness in the sense of employees working inside an organization in this fourth phase of corruption literally give up hope that it's ever going to change. They are convinced that in the, in the course of their career, nothing's going to make a difference. The organization is just deeply corrupt. They hate where they work. They hate what they do. They can rationalize their own misconduct. And many times they're partaking in misconduct and they're rationalizing everything, everything they do because they, they've convinced themselves that they feel like the victim. 
and they're just hopeless and they don't even try to work their career with honor and integrity. And the, and the last phrase, survival. I sometimes call this survival of, of the fittest because in, in, in some case studies, this becomes so ingrained, so deep, so hateful that employees turn on each other. They, they set each other up. This, everybody's just out for themselves. And they stay down here. I mean, it can't get any worse. There are, there are entire groups of people in this final phase, the fourth and final phase, rationalizing misconduct and everything's they're out for themselves and everything's driven on greed. In the end, the goal, of course, is to prevent these phases from, from beginning in, at all inside an organization and focus on, on, on this. And the tool for doing that is what we're doing right now. It's education, it's, it's training, it's understanding what areas of leadership and management have, have such a powerful direct connection to maintaining integrity and what the solutions are to those areas. I call these the major areas of, of uh, the causes of, of, of corruption because once we understand how the continuum begins and ends, now we're in a position to do something about it. I'm Neil Troutman, and this segment's on field training officers and integrity. And I'd like, like to talk directly to field training officers in, the, in this segment and perhaps say some things that you've never